Hey everyone, welcome to Judging for the Win. I'm Dave, and this is my daily ruling. If you're from the US, then that means that today is Thanksgiving. And what am I thankful for? That's right, my patrons. So today, I'm doing my patron pick. But it's not just my patrons that I'm thankful for. Anybody who supports this channel in any way has my gratitude. All of the stuff that everybody does, from liking, sharing, subscribing, or recommending my videos to a friend, all of that stuff helps give me the motivation to keep going and it gives me a warm feeling in the pit of my heart every time I think about it. So, to anyone who supports my channel in any way at all, thank you so much. Now, when I put my patron poll out to decide what the topic for today's video was going to be, I had an extra bonus one that I put in there. I had Dave's special secret ruling, and I guess everybody's curiosity got the better of them. Because I got a lot of questions about Disturb, I thought that would be a good topic for today's episode. There are a bunch of different Disturb cards out there now that we have the new ones from Crimson Vow, and I know it's kind of a cop-out putting this in the middle of Crimson Vow week, but many of the questions that I received were due to the fact that the new Crimson Vow ones had the extra twist of having an aura on the backside instead of just another creature. So I think this should be alright. Many of the questions in today's episode only really make sense if you're considering the Crimson Vow Disturb cards that have an aura on the backside. However, if the question does make sense for the older ones, then its answer should apply to them just as well. I'll be sure to point something out in case there's any sort of confusion. Now, on to the questions. Well, okay, you know me. The first thing that I'm going to say is we'll look at the comprehensive rules. So here are a couple of relevant passages from the comprehensive rules that I pulled out to help get everybody situated. And so this is the definition for disturb that we got out of uh, the CR702. And there's another thing that specifically talks about casting a spell transformed, which disturb is basically, as far as I'm aware, the only real way to do that that can come up without jumping through a bunch of hoops. So these are going to be pretty important for us for the rest of the day, and so I urge everybody to bookmark this or make a mental note of it and then jump back anytime that you're interested in reviewing the exact text. So that's the convenience feature that I put in there. Hopefully that is something that everybody will make use of as they see fit. Okay, so now let's get to some actual questions. And the first one here is how do alternate costs work? So the idea is, of course, uh, we have the Fist of Sons and we want to play the Beloved Beggar's back half uh, disturbing it. Uh, so what what do you think? Is it possible to pay the Wooberg cost instead of the uh, six mana cost that you would normally be paying to disturb this card? And so the relevant, first of all, you can see that this is uh, uh, an older disturb card, and that means that the answer for this one is going to be the same uh, with, with the old disturb cards and the new ones. Uh, the disturb mechanic works the same way for this specific question, and the relevant rule that you would need to know uh, is going to be this one here. So only one alternate cost can be applied to a spell as it's being cost. Now Disturb does count as being an alternate cost, and so therefore uh, you can only use the Disturb cost or the Wooberg cost in order to cast the spell. You can only apply one of those, and you cannot use both of them together. So that would mean that it's not possible for you to uh, pay Wooberg to Disturb anything uh, with Fist of Suns. Uh, the same can be said for uh, stuff like um, you know, there's not really a way to give creatures flashback, but if there was some other way to cast it uh, without paying its mana cost, for example, that'd be another one. Uh, without paying its mana cost also means uh, an alternate cost, and so therefore it would also not be possible to disturb something without paying its mana cost, uh, because that would be the same problem uh, with this rule here. You're combining two alternate costs, which that is not possible to do. Um, and so the, the next uh, I, I've got kind of like a, a batch uh, that I want to put under the same header here of, of what kind of spell is it, uh, right? So I got a lot of questions that were related to um, basically a little bit of confusion about what kind of spell are we casting. Uh, so of course the Drog Skull Infantry uh, is different characteristics on its front face from what it has on its back face. So in order to uh, answer all these questions, we would have to really understand uh, what point the uh, characteristics of the back half take over and at what point the characteristics of the front half stop coming to play. So with this one uh, we've got Steel Golem which says you can't play creature spells. So of course uh, the idea being that we're, we're trying to disturb the Drog Skull Infantry uh, which on its front face is a creature but on its back face is not a creature. So what, what would we uh, say about this situation? And so for the answer to that we're going to take a look at this passage here uh, which is only the front face uh, is going to be face up on the stack when we're casting a spell transformed. Um, so only that face 
is going to be evaluated to determine if the spell can be cast. And only that one is considered to be put onto the stack. So with that being the case, uh, the first thing you do when you're casting uh, a spell uh, would be to move it from whatever zone it's on onto the stack. So that means when we're disturbing one of these cards, the first thing we do is we take it out of our graveyard and we put it onto the stack. And at no point is the front face going to be face up on the stack. The back face is going to be face up from the very beginning. And so what that means is the Steel Golem is not going to see us trying to cast a creature spell. It's going to see us trying to cast an aura spell. And hey, that's A-OK. -okay. We can do that. Uh, no problem. Um, so the same, same kind of logic would apply if you were to have something like a, a Thalia, for example. So with this, when we're deciding how much the spell costs to cast, and again, that also takes place when we're casting the spell, um, the Thalia is not going to see Drogskull infantry at all. Only the characteristics of the Drogskull armaments are going to exist if we're disturbing that card. And so that means the Thalia would indeed be uh, applying to that situation. Um, same kind of idea with Prowess. Uh, again, when we uh, have cast the spell, that is when we've gone through all of the steps involved in the casting process, then at that point the game is going to see, well, it looks like we just cast a Drogskull armaments, which is a enchantment aura and not a creature spell. Uh, so yes, you would in fact get a prowess trigger uh, out of doing something like that. And uh, same same kind of idea with the Disdainful Stroke. Actually, the Disdainful Stroke um, is a little bit interesting. Um, if, if you go back to the, the part where it talks about um, casting a spell transformed, uh, there is a special little uh, kind of asterisk in there that says only the characteristics of the face that's face up exist, but if you're trying to decide what the mana cost or the mana value is, um, then you would do that by looking at the front face and, and looking at the, the information that you would see on the front face. Because, of course, Drogskull Armaments uh, does not have any symbols at all up here. And so the Disdainful Stroke, uh, even though we're paying four mana to disturb it, uh, that's not the uh, mana value of the spell. It's actually uh, going to be based on these symbols up here. Even though we're not paying this cost, we're paying this cost. Um, and even though there's nothing written up here. So the Disdainful Stroke would not work uh, against the Drogskull Armaments. Now, conversely, if you were going to use something like a Spell Snare, well, you can see the Spell Snare uh, counters a mana value of 2. And so when we're trying to decide the mana value of this, we're not going to be looking uh, at this face. We're going to be looking at this face, even though this is the face that we're casting. Uh, and so the Spell Snare will indeed uh, be able to counter this spell, no matter which half of it uh, you're casting. So that that's kind of interesting, and that that's kind of like the only uh, you know real caveat. Now uh, the next thing I want to talk about, and maybe this is something that uh, only I was concerned about, um, because it it is kind of like a little bit of a deeper kind of a question. Uh, the the amount of rules familiarity you would need to to think about something like this. Well, you would probably have to be like thinking of rules questions all the time if, if you're worried about stuff like this. But if, if this is something you were concerned about, I have good news for you. So you might be wondering something like, can you even cast these spells at all? And the reason that I asked that is because remember what we were talking about. Uh, this is the thing that the game is seeing when we're casting the spell, right? The, the front half characteristics don't exist at all, right? Um, we had a special like exception for the, the mana value and the mana cost uh, before, but uh, when I'm looking at this, uh, I'm trying to decide, you know, how much mana should I spend to, to cast this spell? And, you know, to me, uh, to me it seems like there isn't a mana cost. Um, and, and, you know, maybe... Maybe if, if we're thinking about like what we were saying before, if you are able to look at the front side to see the mana cost, uh, well, you know, th then maybe you would see the mana cost as being like a one and a white. Um, but again, that's not the disturb cost. And so, you know, if, if you really wanted to think about that some more, you would maybe be thinking like, well, hey, um, I'm trying to cast this from my graveyard, right? Is that okay? Because, you know, usually you can't cast spells from your graveyard. Now, I don't see anything written here. Uh, that, that says I can cast it from my graveyard either. So you, you might be concerned about all that kind of uh, stuff, and, and you, you might be wondering, like, well, you know, how, how, does, how does this actually even work at all? Um, and so, you know, if you, if you look at the comprehensive rules, you can see that uh, only the face that will be face up is evaluated to determine if it can be cast. And, and so it, it does look like we might be in a little bit of trouble um, because, again, there, there's nothing on that face, uh, the, the back half, that says that we can cast it. 
Um, however, uh, fortunately, the rules do have a, are back on this one, which says that if an ability uh, of the front face allows it to be cast transformed, then that ability is also considered uh, when evaluating that spell to determine if it can be cast. Uh, and it specifically says that this is an exception to this rule up here. So it's good. Um, everything's okay. The, the rules team had our back on this one. And so this is, in fact, the reason why uh, you're able to cast these spells uh, transformed at all. Uh, if we didn't have this rule here, then the game would come into uh, a little bit of a problem when it's trying to decide whether it's legal for us to cast this spell or trying to decide what the cost to cast it would be. So that, that's the, the purpose of this rule here, and that's, that's like kind of what's going on underneath the hood uh, in that type of case. Um, and, and so speaking, speaking of, uh, how, how, how does transforming work, right? Um, you know, th that's, that is kind of an interesting question here because these, these of course can't normally transform. Um, but hey, you know, we've, we've got cards in Magic's history that can like transform other stuff like Moonmist. Um, but like, as it turns out, there, there are no human, uh, creatures. <laughs> there are no human creatures, uh, that, that have this disturb where the, the back half of it is an aura, and I wonder why. Uh, there, there were creatures that had Disturb normally, uh, but there were not creatures that had uh, Disturb and, and the back face is an aura. And I, I imagine that this is, this is probably the reason why is uh, stuff like this. But hey, you know what? There's some other cards in Magic's history that, that we can use for situations like this. So if we use Artificial Evolution, and, and we're going to change the text of Moon Mist, uh, to transform all spirits, uh, then, you know, then we can maybe come into uh, a little bit of a situation here, right? Uh, because we're, we're trying to decide uh, what, what's going to happen with the, with the Drog Skull infantry. Um, so maybe if you watch the, the channel a lot, you might remember uh, I put out a video a while ago about if you were going to show and tell an aura into play and uh, how, how that worked. And I noted that there was a specific problem uh, that, that might come up. And the problem is this. The problem is, in a game of Magic, you're not allowed to just do stuff, right? Like, you can't just, like, do things just because you want to. There has to be something in the game that's instructing you to do that thing, right? So, like, for example, if I wanted to just discard a card for no reason, I couldn't do that, right? There has to be something in the game that's letting me discard a card. Um, and so the reason that that's important is because if you look at Moon Mist, it says to transform all spirits, but what it does not say is it does not say to attach those spirits to something, right? So when you transform Drog Skull Infantry, uh, you know, which you would do by just, you know, turning it to the other side, uh, there's, there's no reason in the game why you cannot transform this card. Um, but what's going to happen is after you transform it, it's going to be an aura with enchant creature that is not enchanting anything uh, because the moon mist did not tell you to attach it to something. It just said to transform it. And so because you did not attach it to anything, it's not going to be attached to anything. And so with that being the case, uh, the, the Drog Skull armaments, the next time state-based actions uh, are performed, it, it's going to go away. Uh, because state-based actions say, hey, you're, you're an aura that's not attached to anything. And so, of course, normally it would be put into your graveyard. Uh, the, the Drog Skull Armaments has this extra thing on here that says it would be exiled instead, so uh, it actually will just get exiled um, with, with the, uh, the Moon Mist transforming it uh, in that case. So, that's pretty cool. But, what if we had another card? Right, so like for this one, we're, we might have to use a little bit of imagination. I don't, I don't really expect that this is going to be like a, um, you know, showing up in any pro tours or anything. Um, but it is kind of fun to think about this sort of stuff from time to time. So like for this question, what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to use some card to make this Drog Skull Infantry into a copy of Biolumeg, right? And there's all kinds of cards you can use to do that sort of thing, like a True Polymorph or like a Shape Share or some sort of. You know, some kind of wacky combination. I'm sure people in the comments can can think of, of their favorite wacky way to make the Drog Skull Infantry to be a copy of Biolumeg. Um, but, uh, you know, we're going to do that. Um, and then afterwards, we're going to sacrifice it, right? Because, like, you know, obviously that's that's where we're going with this. So what would happen in that case? And now, now we're getting into a little bit of a, a really interesting one. Because uh, what you see is uh, when you sacrifice Biolum Egg, return it to the battlefield transformed. Uh, under its owner's control at the beginning of the next end step. Uh, so first of all, um, the the fact that the like name and characteristics of this card change after you sacrifice it 
uh, that that's not going to be a problem. Uh, the game is actually going to know that that the like piece of cardboard in your graveyard is the same permanent that is the source of that ability. Uh, so the the fact of the matter is that when when the next end step rolls around, the game is going to be able to identify that this yep this drug skull infantry is indeed the uh, the permanent that got sacrificed. So that's the one that we're supposed to be uh, returning to the battlefield transform. Um, so we, we, you might be concerned a little bit uh, that, that we're going to have the same sort of problem as, as what we had in the previous situation, right? Because again, nothing here uh, says to uh, return it to the battlefield transformed and attached to something, uh, right? And if you if you look at some of the other ones, um, like the, the Strangler card, uh, if, if you look at some of the other uh, cards that when they transform, the transformed half is an aura, the, the thing that puts them back onto the battlefield generally will say... Uh, something like that. It'll say something to that effect of return it to the battlefield attached to, you know, whatever, whatever you're supposed to attach to. But you can see that this situation, of course, does not have anything like that because, of course, the Bioloom egg, when you transform it, it's it's not normally going to be attached to anything. So why would they write something like that in there? That'd just be kind of weird. Um, but uh, it turns out that in this case, uh, actually, the, the CR does have our back on this. Uh, so if an aura... And remember, we're, we're putting it onto the battlefield transform, so the game is going to see that this is an aura entering the battlefield. Uh, uh, under any control, uh, under a player's control by any means other than resolving as an aura spell, which is what we're doing here, and the effect that's putting it onto the battlefield does not specify what it will enchant, which, again, that's the case here, uh, that player will choose what it will enchant. So in this case, uh, actually, yes. Yes, you will be able uh, to put it onto the battlefield, enchanting whatever uh, thing that you want, um, and, uh, as an added bonus, uh, you, you actually could put it on something that has hexproof, um, or, uh, uh, something that, uh, you know, has shroud or you wouldn't normally be able to put it on. Uh, like if you put it on a ward creature, it would not count as, uh, targeting it. So you wouldn't have to pay any extra. Uh, so I made another video where I talked about that in, in like some more detail. You could check that out if you're interested. Um, but the, the cool part that I wanted to highlight here is that, yes, uh, even though the situation might look kind of similar to the Moon Mist one, uh, where it just, you know, immediately fell off because of state-based actions, in this case, even though there's nothing that says to put it onto the battlefield enchanting something, you actually still do get to enchant something um, because of this this specific rule here. And uh, again, the, the reason why this one does not work with the, the Moon Mist is because the aura isn't entering the battlefield with Moon Mist. It's already on the battlefield and Moon Mist is just transforming it. Um, so it's it's not leaving the battlefield and then coming back like what the, the Bioloom Egg did. And that's the reason why this one, uh, the, the Bioloom Egg does work and other, other stuff that makes you leave the battlefield and then come back transformed. Um, okay, so that that was all the questions that I had uh, prepared for today's episode. And, and again, thank you so much to all my patrons. Um, could not be doing this without you. Well, you know, I, I, I guess I could be doing it without you, but the, the fact that you're supporting me uh, as patrons really means a lot to me. And I probably would not do as much uh, of this without you or as good of a job uh, without you. So, you know, everybody give yourselves a pat on the back for that. Um, everybody else, uh, like I said before, thank you so much uh, for giving me your likes, your subscribes, your follows, whatever whatever social media stuff there is, uh, and your attention. Because uh, I know that going through, uh, you know, however long this ends up being worth of magic content, um, you know, it, it might not be for everybody, but I do appreciate that there are people out there who are interested in hearing this sort of stuff. And as long as there are people like that out there, I'm going to probably be making these videos for you. So thank you so much to everybody. And I hope everyone has an awesome day.